Hey everybody, in today's video, I'm gonna show you my personal workflow for the ASIR. And my goal today is to show you exactly what you need to do when you go out there at night. That way, if you get confused and you're not sure what step to do next or you encounter a problem, hopefully this will help to answer your questions. With that said, we're not gonna get into all the various minute settings today. We're gonna to try to keep it simple and just show you exactly what you need to know. Before we go any further, I wanna mention that I will be using the ASIR Mini today for this video. But whether you have the ASAR Plus, the Plus that has 256 gigabytes of storage, or even the older Pro, you can still follow along with me today. There's not really gonna be much difference. One other thing I wanted to mention is the difference between connecting with an iPad versus an Android phone, for example. It seems that my iPad is able to connect much further away to the ASAR compared to my Android phones I've used over the years. My point here is simply that if you have an iPad, I'd highly recommend using that rather than potentially your Android phone. It'll make things easier to see on that bigger display. It should be able to connect to the Wi-Fi network even better. And your iPad should also be able to run all night long without completely draining the battery. With that said though, I actually will be showing you today my Android phone just because that was easier to record for the video. All right, let's get right into this. So the first thing you wanna do is plug in all your cables, turn on the ASIR, and then wait for the beep. Once you hear the beep, you can go to your phone's Wi-Fi settings, and then we're gonna look for the new ASIR network. If this is your first time connecting to it, you wanna click on it and then enter the default password, which is 12345678. You should now be connected to the ASIR's Wi-Fi network, and now we can start up the ASIR app on our phone. When you get this pop-up here though, you wanna make sure that you stay on the Wi-Fi. This is another problem I've seen on Android where it will detect your home Wi-Fi network potentially, and reconnect to that because it knows it has internet, whereas the ASIR does not have internet. So just be sure you enable that setting, that way it doesn't automatically disconnect you. And one of the common misconceptions about the ASIR is that you need to have some sort of network connection to use it, but that is not true. I always use my ASIR out in the middle of nowhere in the desert without any sort of cell reception. It's gonna work just fine. The only trouble that you're gonna encounter is actually right here. You can see that my latitude and longitude is set for Kanab, Utah but right now I'm back in Washington and it looks like it never updated here on the app. So this would be the one thing you have to check manually every time if you are moving. If you're shooting from the same location night after night, you don't have to worry about this. Anyway, what I need to do now is figure out my current latitude and longitude and get that implemented. This is another thing I've noticed. It actually works better on the iPad. I don't have this issue as much, but on my Android phone, I do. So what I'm doing is using the Photographer's Ephemeris app. I don't think you can actually get this anymore but it's an easy way to see your latitude and longitude. If you don't have this app or you can't find it, you can always use Google Maps. The big thing to understand here is that it doesn't matter if your coordinates are perfect. As long as you're at like 40 degrees north and you have 40 degrees north, that's usually close enough. Really what it's gonna come down to is if you hit go to, it might not completely center up the object initially. So that's your main concern. But eventually, if you are gonna be shooting from the same location night after night, be sure to figure out your exact coordinates and input them. But for tonight, again, as long as you're fairly close, it'll be fine. One of the problems you might encounter if you need to figure out your coordinates is that the ASIR, again, does not have any sort of internet connection. So you might have to disconnect from the ASIR network temporarily to get your coordinates or your Wi-Fi again and get those data points figured out. Just remember to reconnect to the ASIR network once you're done. I realize that was all pretty convoluted, but it's probably gonna happen to you sooner or later, so I thought we should cover it today. Once you've done this once though, you shouldn't have to worry about it again. Next, we wanna look over on the right and we see all of our camera gear potentially. We'll start with the mount. I'm using the ZWO AM5 mount, so I'll select that from the dropdown. You might be using a Celestron or a Skywatcher though. You wanna select your own mount from the list here. Moving down, we have the main scope focal length and the guide scope focal length. Because I'm using a RedCat telescope, my main scope focal length is 250 millimeters. Next, we have the guide scope, and because I'm using the ASI 2600 dual camera, technically the guide scope is my main telescope, the Red Cat. So I'm gonna put 250 millimeters for both my main scope and my guide scope. However, most of you will be using a separate auto guider and guide scope. So you will want to figure out your guide scope's focal length. It's usually 120 millimeters for a lot of them. If you're not sure what it is, you might wanna pause, go figure that out, and then come back. Moving down, we have our main camera. Again, I'm using the 2600 Duo today. If it's not available though, that's okay. 
There's a common problem, especially with the ASAR Plus models, which we'll talk about here in a minute. I repeat, if your main camera is not visible here, and you've double checked that the power cable and the USB cable are plugged in, that's okay, I'll show you how to fix it in a minute. If you notice that a lot of your components are not able to be selected, it's most likely because your USB cables were not connected properly. So go back, look for all your cables, make sure everything's plugged in, and then you should be able to select it from the drop down menu. When you've got everything configured, we'll click the enter button, and we are now in the main user interface for the ASI Air. The first thing I wanna do though is make sure that everybody has their main camera connected because we talked about the potential issue. If your camera had the issue where you couldn't find it, click on the Wi-Fi icon at the top of the screen. Then you're gonna look for the four power outputs there, which should be listed. Most likely if you have the ASA or Plus, all those power switches are turned off. That's why your camera's not able to be detected. So what you need to do is look on the underside of your ASA or Plus and figure out which power connection you plugged in the camera to. Then you wanna turn on the corresponding switch here in the ASI Air. I normally plug my camera into port one and then turn on the switch for port one. You can also change the drop down so it says camera so you know what it is for future reference. And then just make sure to always plug in that cable to this power port from now on. You can leave the other ports turned off unless you need them. Now that you've done that, you should hear the fan kick on on your camera. You can go to your main camera settings and it should now be listed. We can select it and then turn on the switch to power our camera. At this point, everybody should have their camera connected. We can go back to the main shooting interface just by clicking off of our settings menu, and then we'll take a three second long photo. You can change your exposure down there at any time. I recommend again, three seconds. When this first photo completes, we wanna make sure we can actually see some stars and then we're gonna focus on them. This is where a Badenov mask can really come in handy. If you don't have a Badenov mask, I'd highly recommend getting one. It's one of the best investments you can make. And we see right here, my red cat is currently just a little bit out of focus. And we can tell that because our diffraction spike shows the middle line is slightly to the right. So I'm gonna go over to my focus ring, turn it very slightly, and then take another photo. And we'll see if the focus gets better or worse. All right, it got worse. So that means I turned my focus ring the wrong direction. I'll turn it the other direction and then take another photo. This could take a while. For those that have an electronic assisted focuser, you can run through the autofocus if you want to. When that completes, I'd highly recommend though that you attach a baton mask and take a test photo like I'm showing you here. Because every time I've used an electronic assisted focuser here, it's never gotten the stars completely sharp and I find that I have to manually tweak it after the fact. And that's actually the main reason I don't like using an electronic focuser because in my experience it doesn't work that well and it just adds complications frankly. I'd much rather just turn my focus ring manually every so often. But we're getting close here. My focus is still not quite perfect. I'm gonna keep turning that focus ring. And eventually, once I get that middle spike directly in the middle, we can move on. There we go, perfect. Next, I'll remove my Badenov mask from the telescope, and that completes step one. We've focused our telescope. Now we can continue on with the rest of the workflow. Okay, so I removed my Badenov mask. I took another preview photo just to show you that it's now been removed. And one thing I haven't explicitly said yet is that at any time you can zoom in or out of the photo just by pinching and zooming. Sometimes people forget that they're zoomed in though, and that causes problems later. So at any time you can just double tap on the screen and that should zoom you back out to the default view. When you're ready to move on, we'll click on preview and change it to PA for polar align. Next, I want you to make sure that your exposure is set to three seconds. This works really well for me most of the time. One thing I should mention is that maybe you're shooting from a location where you cannot see Polaris. That's okay. You can still do your polar alignment here in the ASI Air. What you'll wanna do is click on the I button up top and then turn on the experimental feature, which is all sky polar align. I did a video on this back in 2022, I think. I'd recommend you go watch that if you wanna learn more. And again, the whole point here is that you don't need to see Polaris for your polar alignment. In my case though, I've got my mount roughly aligned to Polaris, so I'm good to go. We'll go back to our polar alignment here. We'll click on the play button. It will now go through and take its first photo. This helps it to understand what you're looking at. This is why we needed to focus before we went any further and remove our bad knot mask. When that first photo completes, it should be able to plate solve. If you get a failure here or it's just not working, it's probably because you left the bad knot mask on or the stars are not sharp. 
or you have a tree branch or something blocking your view. So check everything over, try it again, and eventually you should get it to work. I want to pause the video for a minute and explain something very important. If the plate solving fails, it's because the ASIR does not understand the image that it's looking at. And unfortunately, there's no way for us to see the preview photo, which could really help diagnose the problem. So what we need to do is stop the polar alignment. After the polar alignment has been stopped, you can click where it says PA and change it back to preview. Now that we're back in the preview window, we can take another preview photo. And this should show us what the problem is. Once you've identified the problem and fixed it, we can then go back to the polar alignment interface and continue on. However, there's one more thing to consider. If you get a plate solving failure on your second image, which we'll see in a minute, then your mount is actually going to be turned down about 60 degrees. So if your mount is at 60 degrees and you start the polar alignment over again, it's going to rotate it even further down. And now there's a chance your telescope will bang into your tripod leg. So it's always a good idea to make sure your mount is in the home position before doing your polar alignment. And to do this, we'll go up to the mount settings, scroll all the way to the bottom, and click the go to home position button. This will return the mount to the default orientation, and now we can continue on and redo our polar alignment. So we'll click on the play button again, the camera will take a photo, and it should be able to plate solve. Then, you're gonna click on the next button. But you gotta be careful, as soon as you click on next, your mount is gonna start moving. And this is where you could have an accident if you didn't tighten everything down, or more likely if your cables get snagged. So I'd recommend you turn on your headlamp or your flashlight and watch the mount very closely. If you see a cable that's not long enough or it's about to get snagged, click the stop button as soon as possible. That should stop the rotation. If it doesn't, turn off the power to the whole thing if you have to. If you have the AM5, there's a power switch right on the side. But I don't want you to damage your camera equipment right here at the start. Anyway, it's gonna move down about 60 degrees and automatically take another photo. It should also be able to plate saw without any issue. And when that's finished, we'll click on Let's Go. We are now in the final step of our polar alignment. There's a lot going on here, but I want you to ignore the circles. Everybody focuses on the circles and they get confused. All you care about are those numbers and the directions of the arrows over on the right. In my case, I need to move the entire mount up and to the left. And for this, we'll use our altitude and azimuth screws on the base. So I can turn my altitude screw, and there's no set amount here, it really just depends on your total error and how far you have to turn your screws, you'll figure it out eventually. Either way, just make some sort of adjustment, come back to the app, and click on refresh at the bottom of the screen. And check that out. On my first adjustment, I got really close to a perfect alignment in terms of my up-down. Now I can focus on my left-right. So I'll turn my azimuth screws in the same direction at the same time, and once I think I've turned them out far enough in one direction, I'll click the refresh button again. Sometimes you go too far and you overshoot it, so you have to turn them in the same direction the opposite way, and then refresh again. This will take some time to get used to. Another problem you might have is that your screws are too tight and you can't really turn them. For this, you'll need to loosen the little set screw adjustments on the sides, and now it should be much easier to turn. Occasionally, you'll reach the end of the limit of which you can turn the screws. You can't turn them any further. If that happens, you have to pick up the whole tripod and turn it in that direction very slightly. So for example, if I get maxed down, I can't go any further to the right, I'd pick up my tripod very carefully, turn it to the right slightly, set it back down, I'd refresh the mount again, and I'd see how far I have to adjust things. So that's one workaround. Eventually though, you'll get the hang of this, and in my case, I was done in less than four minutes. I can now click finish. I'd recommend you try to get to that smiley face, but if you just can't seem to get the error that low, you can always stop it early and move on. But the better your polar alignment, the longer you can shoot without star trails, the better the go-to will be, and more. With our polar alignment finished, we'll click on PA, and we'll change that back to preview. Think of preview as our main interface for most of the workflow. There's a lot of other buttons you can choose like focus, live, plan, but we won't really be using any of those except for auto run. Anyway, once you get back to the preview window, we can now move on to step three. Step one is focusing, step two is polar alignment, step three is to find our object and get it centered up. We can do this from the preview window with the sky atlas button. 
which is that Big Dipper icon there in the lower left. Once you click on the Big Dipper icon, you're now in the Sky Atlas, and the first thing to understand is the difference between the red rectangle and the blue rectangle. The blue rectangle is where the mount thinks you're aimed at. The red rectangle is where you want the mount to go. And we can just click and drag on the screen to move the red box around. For example, I can move it over to the Heart Nebula, get that centered up, and then click on Go To. That's my preferred way of finding my objects and then getting them centered. In your case, so if you don't know where these objects are at, no big deal. You can click on the Objects button, which has the magnifying glass on the left. That will bring you into the search window. And from here, you've got all kinds of choices. You can start off with tonight's best and just scroll down until you recognize an object you want to photograph. For example, we have the Andromeda Galaxy. If we click on that, we can click on Go To, and now our mount will go directly to Andromeda. If you don't find the object though, then click on the search button in the top right. When you get to this screen, you need to know the object's M number or IC number or NGC number, whatever it might be. It will not understand Orion or Andromeda. For example, if I did want to shoot the Pleiades, I would need to know M45. And that's why I recommend researching the objects ahead of time so you can write that number down and then input it here in the ASIR. Anyway, for tonight, I'm just going to find something here in tonight's best or even just move my little box around. For example, if I want to photograph the North American Nebula, I can go back to our map screen here, find the North American Nebula overhead. It's right near the meridian. There we go. And I'll get that centered up as good as I can. Then once it's pretty close to being centered up, I'll click on Go To. My mount will now go directly to the North American Nebula. You have to be careful here, though. There's a chance again that your cables could get snagged or something could come loose, who knows? So I recommend you turn on your headlamp and look things over very closely. If you notice a cable is about to get snagged, make sure you hit the stop button, or again, worst case scenario, just turn off the power. That way you don't have an accident. I'm not trying to scare you here, but I've heard way too many horror stories of people losing months of time and money having to repair their gear because they overlook something simple like this. I don't want that to happen to you. But in just a few seconds, your object should be centered up, and at that point, the red and the blue boxes are overlapping. We can now back out of the Sky Atlas window right here, go back to our preview window, and I'd recommend taking a test photo just to make sure we like our composition. I'm gonna do 30 seconds, click on the circle, and that will begin our preview. While this preview is being taken, I noticed that I'm almost out of space here on my internal storage. This is one of the downsides of the ASA or Mini, is it doesn't have a lot of internal storage. So what I can do is if I go to my folders here, I can see all the photos that I've taken that are currently saved on the device. And one of my favorite features of the ASIR is that if you're shooting for multiple nights in a row, you can actually use these images to redo your composition, which is something we'll take a look at later. Right now, I'm just showing you how to delete some of your photos if you need to, to free up some space. Anyway, once I've deleted these photos, let's take a look. So I can click on any image I've captured before, and we see this interface right here. If I zoom in, we can see that the stars are pretty sharp. But if I click on Detect Star, it should be able to identify the stars and then give me some values. When that completes, I can also click on Annotate and check it out. It actually knows the Crescent Nebula is here in the photo. So for example, let's say I want to get the same composition tonight. I'll click on Go To. My mount will now get the exact same composition. And if it notices my sensor is rotated a little bit, it'll even allow me to correct for that which is something I was not able to capture for this video. But I just want to show you just how powerful this tool can be for shooting multiple nights, trying to get the same composition. Anyway, let's get back to our preview and see how that photo turned out. And here we can see the North American Nebula. It looks pretty good. Our stars are still sharp, that's a good sign. And overall, I think this is gonna work for us tonight. Another thing to understand about the ASA error is that these preview photos are not being saved. They're just temporary. If you actually want to take real photos, We'll have to do that here in a few minutes. But the next part of our workflow, after we've gotten our objects centered up, which is, let's say, step four, step five is we need to begin our guiding. We can do that by clicking on the guide button on the left. That should bring up a little graph. If we tap on the graph, we are now in the completely separate guiding interface. And this is what controls all of our auto guider settings. Really, all you should have to do is set your exposure to three seconds, then click the begin looping arrows. That tells your auto guider to begin taking images so you can see what's going on. And here's our current preview image. That looks okay, but it is a bit bright. 
In your case though, it might be a bit dark. So at any time you can go to your guide settings up top and adjust the gain slider for your guide camera. I'd recommend doing this every single night. You don't want your stars to be really big and bright, but you also need to be able to see something. And to me, this looks like a properly exposed photo. Anyway, once you can see your stars fairly well, you'll click on the next button down, which looks like a crosshair. This is your begin guiding. At this point, it's gonna go through and do the guiding calibration. You can see there it says West Step 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's gonna count all the way up to 16. At that point, it'll say East Step 16 and count down back to zero. Then it does North and South. This takes about three to five minutes to complete. It's important to understand that while this is running, you don't wanna to touch anything. That will screw things up because it's really critical now that the mount understands its relation to the night sky, the orientation, and everything else. And in fact, I normally tell my students just to get away from everything, go take a break and then come back, and by the time you get back, this should be finished. While that's running though, I should mention that if you can't see any stars at all, it's because your guide scope is not properly focused. And I've got some separate videos on that that will explain how to do it. There's not much we can do while the calibration's running, so let's take a look at some of our settings. If we go to the Wi-Fi settings here on the mini, you can see that there's not really all that much to do. But one thing in particular I want everybody to check out is under the Personalized tab. If you're using an iPad especially, your interface might be very small and hard to read. But there should be a setting in here on your iPad that allows you to increase the resolution and the size of the screen, either 125 or 150%. I'd recommend you give that a try and see if it makes it easier for you to follow along with. In my case, because I'm on an Android phone, it's not currently available. You also have the ability in here to change the sound mode if the beep is too loud for you, and also between Celsius and Fahrenheit, although it doesn't really matter that much. Let's back out of our ASIR settings and move down to the main camera settings right here. I'm using the 2600 Duo camera. I've got that switch turned on. And the most important setting here is your gain. This is something I've covered in some of the other videos. To make your life easier though, just click on the M button that should use your camera's ideal gain. If you use anything lower than your camera's ideal gain, you may encounter artifacts in your final image. So again, click on M. It should be 100 in most cameras. Sometimes it's 120. Stick with that value though and you'll be fine. The main scope focal length for me, it auto calculated to 248. That's fine. Then we have the cooler. I'd highly recommend you turn that on and put it to minus 20 degrees Celsius or minus four Fahrenheit. That will help to reduce the grain in your final image. Also, if you have the ability, turn on anti-dew. And the thing to understand here with the cooling system is that if you want to take your calibration frames, like your darks especially, they need to match the same sensor temperature. This brings us to customize file name. Be sure to go into customize file name and turn on the switches for all of these settings. This will now embed that information into the file name of every single photo, which makes it much easier to stay organized. And note that the text there is not actually accurate, just placeholder, so you might realize it's not the camera you're using, that's fine. Moving back to our advanced settings, I've seen where people have auto white balance turned off for some reason and they get really green looking photos, so be sure to turn on auto white balance. Also turn off continuous preview, that will actually screw things up in the long run, and everything else is up to you. That's all there is to it for the main camera settings. Let's take a look at our auto guider and see how that's coming. And actually it's already done. We've got the green crosshair, that looks good. And now we have some red and blue lines on our graph. The red and blue lines represent our right ascension error and our declination error. Those are the two ways our camera can turn when we have the go-to mount. At any time you can clear the graph though, and that might give you some more accurate readings. Right now my total error is pretty close to zero, which is really nice. And you can see there now it updated total error is 0.59 arc seconds. That's pretty good. Anything below one arc second is amazing as far as I'm concerned. And this would be a good time to double check that your exposure is still set to three seconds. That works really well for me. We can now back out of the guiding interface and we're in our preview window. From here, we'll click on preview and change that to auto run. Auto run is how we actually take photos and save them with the ASIR. Then we'll click on the three dots and three lines. This is our shooting schedule and we can configure everything we need to from this interface. First, start with the target name. This is easy to overlook, and if you don't set this properly, it gets very confusing when you get to the computer. In my case, I'm testing out the new LO Quad filter from Optolong, so I'll put that in the file name. But let's say you're shooting with a monochrome camera and you don't have a filter wheel. 
you might want to call this North American Nebula red filter and then set it to take a bunch of red filtered images. Again, the main thing I want you to take away from this is that that file name should have as much detail in it as possible. That way you can refer back to that later on when you get to the computer. Moving down, you can have a delay if you want to and also an interval, but I'd recommend you set them both to zero to rule out any potential problems. Also, shut down the ASR and go to home position. I'd highly recommend leaving those turned on. It kind of just automates things at the end of the night for you. I'm going to delete my current shooting schedule and then add a new one by clicking on the plus button. And the first thing you'll see is the type of file. This will just reflect in the file name. So we're gonna take light frames, of course. And then our exposure, this is like our shutter speed. How long do you want the photo to be? I normally shoot five minutes, regardless of the object, the filter, or anything else. And that works well for me. The gain, I'm gonna to set to global gain because we already said that earlier to a value of 100, which is our camera's native ISO or gain in this case. Repeat, that's how many photos you wanna take. I'm just gonna put it to 30 and check this out. If we go to the bottom of the screen now, it's telling us it'll take about two hours and 30 minutes to complete. Well, that's not really long enough. Let's go longer. So if I go back to my sequence here, I can tell it to take 60 photos instead. And now that's gonna take upwards of five hours to complete. That's a little bit too long. I only have about four hours. So I just wanted to show you that that estimate there can help you figure out exactly how long this is gonna take. You might wanna really look into that. Anyway, everything should now be configured. My file name, my mount settings, my camera settings. I can back out of the shooting schedule. And we see our guiding is still looking really nice. So I can move that out of the way. And when you're ready to take your photos, Click on that circular button there. It's gonna warn you that it's gonna shut down and go to home, that's fine. We'll hit confirm. And there we go, we are not taking our first photo. We see the countdown. I always recommend you just sit here and wait for the first photo to complete and make sure there's no problems. So I'll pick back up with you guys when this first photo is finished. All right, we're back and we see our very first image. This looks really good actually. I'm shooting during almost the full moon and yet we still have a nice view of the North American Nebula just because it is so bright and I'm using that new Optolong L-Quad filter. It is pretty grainy though, which we'll get to in an entirely separate video. But at any time, you can pause your auto run, and in my case, I'm going to the preview window. What I'm trying to show you now is potentially on your first photo, you notice the stars are blurry. That's always one thing you want to inspect on that first image, because if you have blurry stars, that needs to be fixed right now. I'm actually gonna even go back to my guide settings and stop that. The reason I'm stopping my auto guider is because it's so sensitive. If I even put the pattern of mask on or touch the telescope in any way, it's gonna go crazy. So it's better to just stop it ahead of time. All right, so what I've done is I've attached my pattern of mask. I've gone back to the preview window and I'm gonna take a three to five second long test photo. I wanna make sure my stars are sharp. Again, I'm assuming your stars were slightly blurry. So I repeat step one as I showed you at the beginning of the video until that pattern of mask shows our stars are perfectly focused. Once you've got your stars perfectly focused again, we can go into our guide settings. We'll begin looping. We'll begin guiding. And because we've done our calibration once, you don't really have to worry about it. It's already calibrated and ready to go. Then we can back out of our guiding, change from preview back to auto run, and resume our shooting schedule. So it should only take you about two or three minutes to get refocused if you have to, and you can let it run. I will say that I keep a close eye on things, and if at any time I notice that my auto run images here are a little bit blurry, I'll stop everything again and refocus as needed. One final thing I wanna show you is that maybe after your first photo completes, you don't really like the composition. No big deal. We can pause our auto run, go back to the preview window, click on the Big Dipper or the Sky Atlas button, and now we can use our finger just to move the red box around. Remember, the red box is where we wanna go. So maybe I want to get the North American Nebula centered up just a little bit better like this. When I think I've got my composition looking better, I'll hit go to, the mount will move to that new position, then I can go back to auto run and resume my shooting sequence. And that's why I always want you to really pay close attention to that first image because now you can see if your stars are sharp, if your composition looks good, etc. And that concludes my full workflow for the ASIR. We went through all seven steps roughly. Step one was focusing. Step two was our polar alignment. Step three was using the sky atlas to center up our object. Step four was to begin guiding. 
Step five was to configure the auto run and start it. Step six in this case was to look everything over, make sure it looked good. And then step seven was roughly to fix our composition and focus if need be, and then restart the auto run. I might have gotten my steps mixed up there, but you've seen the full process today. This is what I do every single night, and I've gotten it pretty streamlined, even to the point where I can do my polar alignment in less than two minutes and have everything up and running in less than 20 on most nights. So I'd recommend you rewatch this video. You might even want to find a way to download it, take it on your phone with you out there in the field, so that we can refer back to it at any time. And if you want to learn even more about the ASIR and all the little things that come along with it, you can check out my Deep Space course, which has over 100 videos, and I teach you everything I know about capturing your data, editing your data, and everything else you could possibly want to know. That's all I've got for you today, though. I hope this video helps you out, and I'll see you guys in another tutorial.